Hello. Uh, so as uh, Adam said, uh, my name is Brian Arnold. Uh, I am a staff software engineer at Bizarre Voice. Uh, if you haven't heard of us, but you've read reviews of something online, if it's not on Amazon, it's probably powered by us. Uh, we do some pretty cool stuff, and we're looking for people if you want to talk to me afterwards. Anyhow, um, <laughs> I'm also a Dojo Core committer. I, I like board games. I have a few in my bag right now. And so what I'm here, I'm here to talk to you about um, debugging using proxies. And so I typically like to just set up um, what it is that we're going to be talking about, why you should care, and then show you some ways to, to use them. Because really, they're, they're pretty powerful tools that you can do a lot with. Uh, in particular, the one I'm showing today is awesome, and I would hate my daily job if I did not have this tool. Um, so let's actually define what it is when we say proxy. Uh, I'm going to use an old trope where I'm going to give you a definition of what that is, where a proxy would be an agent or a substitute that's authorized to act for another person. This isn't what I mean. I'm not going to be your debugging proxy. <laughs> uh, help, I'll, I'll help you, but I'm not going to fix all your stuff. Uh, what I'm talking about specifically is a proxy server, um, where what we're doing is we're basically putting an application in between uh, our browser and the network at large in order to be an intermediary of sorts. Uh, since I had gone to Wikipedia, they had this illustration that I thought was fairly effective where you have your computer, and instead of the request going out directly, you can have it go through this proxy, which then reaches out for you and then hands it back. So really, all we're doing is we're just inserting this extra thing in the middle. And this proxy uh, allows us to do some really interesting things because it lives in the middle. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be discussing a piece of software called Charles Proxy. Um, when I mentioned this at dinner last night to Ben Allman, uh, he said, this is the best tool nobody's ever heard of. And I completely agree with that quote. It's a piece of software, and it's an HTTP proxy that is built to help you debug and fix things. There are others out there. You may have heard of a tool called Fiddler and used that. Uh, there are several other solutions that do pieces of what Charles can do. I'm focusing on Charles because it's cross-platform. Uh, it's the only Java application outside of Minecraft I've actually seen run cross-platform. Uh, it's really a pretty great piece of software. Uh, and again, I could not do my daily job without this. So why should you care about this? The biggest thing in my mind as to why you care about this is that it gives you extra knowledge. With Charles in place, you can see every single thing happening on your network. You can see the requests coming and going. And you might say, well, I have the network pane in my dev tools to do that, right? Not if you're debugging i7. I, I hope you're not there. Fortunately, I don't have to be. But this gives you a way to inspect at a level uh, well beyond anything that the browsers can see. In fact, you may be surprised when you open it up on your entire system and see all of the iCloud traffic or all of Dropbox. Like it's, it's everything, not just browser. It's your entire network. It allows you to alter your requests and your responses. This is incredibly powerful for debugging purposes, being able to change what's going out and what's coming in. Uh, it also allows you to kind of do some sort of uh, security testing in a way. You can be your own man in the middle. You can actively insert malicious or beneficial content uh, for whatever your purpose is. Please don't be evil with this tool, because you totally could be, even though you're going to do it to yourself. But whatever. So what can you even do with Charles Proxy? First off, some of just the basic things. Uh, it gives you what I like to think of as network omniscience. So I'm actually going to show it. In this screen here, this is a list of all of the different network requests that have gone out on my machine since I started running this recently. This is a whole lot of stuff, and I can actively see. OK, so those ones are secure requests. But here, for example, here's a request to Dropbox. This has some info that would probably let you steal my identity. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of information about the network requests that are going on. If I pick one, uh, let's say this JavaScript. Uh, this is a piece off of my blog. I'll show you that horrible website in just a moment. Uh, but this shows you how long it took to respond. I can see the exact details of the request, uh, including uh, all these different headers, uh, cookie information. Uh, again, you could probably become me with that. Uh, you can see what the response was. In this case, it was a 304 not modified because it was a cached hit. Uh, in fact, I can even uh, come in and, well, actually, that's a 304. I'll show it in a, in, a, in a little bit. But if you load an uncached request, 
Uh, you can actually have it do pretty printing and formatting and stuff within Charles to make it just easy to look and see what are all of the things. Another thing it can do, which I just mentioned in a way, is caching. I can disable caching from Charles, not just the browser. And this doesn't just say, oh, well, just disable cache in all the browsers. This is actively going to modify requests and responses to remove e-tags or cache expiration. Like, it neuters the ability to cache things. I've still seen IE6 cache with this in place, but it's much better uh, than what it would be without that. Uh, another thing you might see here in the menu is the ability to block cookies. Uh, that can be really useful if you want to uh, just see kind of a clean environment or you want to prevent cookie information from being transmitted. All that's going to do is just not send the cookie, right? Like it's, that one's actually pretty easy to visualize what it's doing, but it does it for you and it does it at such a level that it's completely cross-browser, which is really nice. Uh, in Chrome, you can disable the cache when you've got DevTools open. In Firefox, you can do the same thing, but you don't have to think about it anymore with this one. In Firefox, it doesn't remember that you disabled it. So I tend to just do this now and not have to think about it. Oh, and you can do DNS spoofing, which if you know how to modify your host file, you probably don't have to worry about that. But it's kind of nice to be able to contain things. I I've actually done it for this very slide. So you can mess around with um, all sorts of DNS entries if you want. Uh, I do not own hold on to your butts. Uh, I want to also talk about mapping. Far and away, the ability to map one network request to another response is the most powerful and useful thing in Charles. So what I'm going to do, um, a little risky because I'm hoping on the network to be OK. <laughs> I have backup in case it's not. Uh, I'm going to take this web page here. This is the Chicago jQuery conference page that we all know and love. It's our itinerary. It's our everything. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, you know, here's a copy of jQuery, and it's 1.9. Maybe I want to see what happens if I update jQuery. And you know, if I were running this locally, I might have a local server, but maybe I don't. Maybe I just want to see what happens. So I'm going to copy this link address. I'm going to go into Charles. I'm going to go into the map remote. So I'm going to enable this option. And I'm going to hit add. And you can specify a wide variety of fields. When I first saw this screen, I hated it because I'm like, I have to actually type in the host separate from the port, separate from the path. This is a big pain. Turns out if you paste into the host and tab, everything just kind of goes into the right spot. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to flat out remap it, but I'm going to change the version. So now I'm going to map from jQuery 1.9, which is what's being used on the Chicago website, to 1.11.1. Uh, and now you'll notice in the lower right, it actually tells me that map remote is enabled in Charles right now. And I'm going to refresh. And now I'm going to filter down to jQuery and find the request. And look, it says 1.9, but really what I actually got back was 111.1. That's incredibly powerful if you want to be able to just test something in a production environment and kind of replace one bit of code with another bit of code, redirection style, uh, without actually having to deploy anything. Uh, I hope that everybody works in environments where you have the ability to have things like test servers, staging sites. Unfortunately, not everybody has that luxury. Uh, so this is a really nice way of just kind of being able to get in the middle of things and mess with it. And if this weren't enough, there's actually a map local as well. And local, this is how I help people fix things all day. This is how I work on all sorts of different problems uh, on my day-to-day -day job. Where what I do, uh, I have another demo set up for this, where I'm going to use the same page. I'm going to turn off my map remote just to go back to jQuery 9. But now I'm going to go into map local. Very similar page. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this URL, and I'm going to say when somebody requests the main page from this computer, instead, I'm going to pick this, this version of the HTML. And what I've done is I've taken this, and I've altered the source just slightly. That way I can see to make sure uh, that things have actually taken effect. Actually, I may need to disable cache to do that. I'm not running it disabled at the full level. So uh, let's see. It's not just jQuery. La, la, la. All right, so I can tell uh, that my changes are actually taking effect here. Uh, I can come down here. Uh, in particular, there were a couple of talk descriptions that got pretty amusing, the state of jQuery, la, la, la. Um, 
Up next is uh, my coworker, Lon, who's talking about making everything fast. Um, this is not the actual talk description, but um, it, it's really amazing to be able to go in and take somebody else's thing, make a local copy of it, and make whatever modifications you need to do. If somebody ever asks you, hey, can you help me fix my stuff, this is actually a really great way to do that without having to get access to their web server or anything. They can just be like, here's a URL with some stuff, and you can go in, you can start grabbing files, and just make your changes and see what happens. And you don't have to deploy, you don't have to put this on a server, it only impacts you, which is really, really nice to be able to work in that level of isolation. Uh, so Chrome. Uh, you can also mimic bad conditions. Uh, this is really useful. Uh, perhaps you've got some sort of a problem that only manifests itself when you're on a slow connection. Uh, so for example, uh, I'm not actually gonna do this to myself, uh, but I can actually enable throttling. Uh, well, I guess I'll turn it on for a second. And I can actually set all sorts of presets, or I can mess with whatever I want. So I'll just pick, say, 3G, and then I'll come over here, and we'll look. Uh, let me pop the network pane back up. Oh, it's all gone. Well, I'll reload it. Um, it is actually gonna be coming in significantly slower, and you can actually see the requests are a good bit longer. And if I come in and I look in, in the Charles details here, it should actually have notes. Actually, you know, throttling may not put notes. When you make changes to things, sometimes it'll put a note in place, like it'll say uh, mapped to remote file or mapped to local file, so you can actually tell things are happening. Uh, I have actively throttled myself here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn that back off because I don't wanna be throttling myself. But it is really nice. Uh, in particular, this combined with hooking up another device to your instance of Charles means that you can emulate 3G experiences on a real physical device uh, without actually having to go into the middle of nowhere and subject yourself to actual 3G speeds, uh, which is pretty nice. Additionally, uh, you can blacklist things. So, uh, you know what, you might not need jQuery. Let's see what happens when I kill jQuery uh, on this page. I can reload this and I'll go into the console and you can see dollars not defined. Uh, I still have Alon's original response here, but the button's not working anymore. So this page actually does need jQuery. Uh, but maybe I want to also kill the styles. Um, it's not exactly the prettiest experience, but you can see that it's actually doing things. Things are actually changing and being blocked. Where this is useful is if you're working on a page that's loading 17 different scripts and one of them's causing a problem and you just don't know what is causing the problem, you can start selectively blacklisting file by file until suddenly things are okay and you know that the last one you blacklisted is the problematic one. Or maybe you wanna implement your own version of Adblock Plus that doesn't require host modifications or it doesn't require a plugin. You can kill whatever sort of network requests and responses you want. Uh, additionally, I would say that when you're putting things in here, wild cards like question marks and dollar signs uh, can be used here. It's not full regular expressions, but you can do some wild carding. So you could say everything from subdomain dot whatever uh, is completely restricted. None of it is allowed through. In this case, I've done very specifically two files, but there have been times where I was working on a site that seemed like it had malicious code, and I just completely blacklisted that source, and everything was fine. Uh, additionally, uh, some other things that you can do uh, while you mess with this is you can do full-on rewriting of the requests and the responses. Uh, so coming back to this page again, uh, I'm gonna make sure I have caching off. Uh, rewriting works a lot better when you're working from a cold cache. This one I actually kept some things around for because it takes a little bit of time to set up. So uh, here I'm gonna say any requests for the main page are now going to have their status changed from whatever the server said into an HTTP 418 I'm a teapot. Uh, I'm also going to make the body respond with the font tag that says I'm a little teapot short and stout because why not? And now when I reload the page, um, it doesn't work. Sometimes it still doesn't go through the cache. Um, I do have another tab though where I've actually already done that so that you can see that it really does uh, impact the results sometimes. And if I look in the network request, here it is. It's coming through, I'm a little teapot, and you can see the request was specifically for jQuery, uh, and it came back with an HTTP 418, because that's what I told it to do here. Oh, you know what, it didn't work, because I didn't actually enable it at this checkbox. 
Uh, that the screen's a little more complex. Let's see if it does it this. Yep. Hey, look at that. So it's kind of cool to be able to do uh, this sort of a change. Uh, there are different things you can do in rewrites as well. Uh, here's a different one I did where I'm going to modify the body uh, in a similar way that I did in my saved file, except this one's going to do the changes on the fly. And now if I reload the page again, the original source does get pulled down, uh, but it's actively going to be modifying. Uh, no, that's actually the old one. Maybe my map local is still in play. Yep, let's turn that off. Uh, map local takes over. Yep, there it is. So uh, it's interesting to be able to also just apply certain rules. Uh, one place that this sort of thing with the rewrites has actively really saved me, uh, we updated our deploy process uh, from an older version of Grunt to 0 0.4. And in the process of doing that, we updated a plugin that we were using to push files to S3. It turns out the plugin that we were using to push things to S3 had been automatically applying the appropriate character set for JavaScript files. It was putting a UTF-8 uh, the, in the content type header in the metadata for the file in the bucket. It turned out when we updated, they decided not to do that anymore, and we pushed out our code, and we're like, this is great. And then we get a page at 1 in the morning saying that uh, all of our customers in any country that uses multi-byte characters uh, all of our Japanese customers, all of our Korean customers, everything was breaking. And that's because we were sending back JavaScript that did not specify a character set, so it was assuming it was ISO 8859-1, uh, which caused uh, string interpretation problems, and we tried to do a split on a string. And it was horrible. We were able to verify that we could fix it by changing the headers without having to touch production simply by saying any JavaScript files that came from our S3 bucket actively go in and modify the content header. So here I could take modify header as the rule. I could say uh, content, whoop, content type, and then I could actively specify what I wanted the content type to be, and I could say to do that on the response. As you can see, there's a lot of things that you can do here in this regard. Uh, by the way, putting that content type on there proved that it was fixed. So we were able to prove within 15 minutes using Charles what our fix should be. Actually implementing it took like an hour, but uh, you know, being able to figure out the problem and resolve the problem quickly was something we could not have done rapidly without Charles. And you can modify all sorts of things. If you're seeing requests go out and for some reason you need to put something new in the query string or you need to remove query string parameters, uh, maybe there's an API key that you don't actually want going out in the request for some reason. You can neuter it. Uh, being able to modify things at this level is pretty amazing. I will say, and they make this advice too when you read their documentation, this particular screen is one of the most complex, if not the most complex, in Charles. Start slow, start small, make little rules and iterate. Because if you try and come up with 17 changes at once and something's not working, you're going to hate yourself. It's going to be terrible to debug. But it's really nice to be able to do so at that level. Another thing you can set is breakpoints. I'm assuming everybody knows what a breakpoint is in code, right? You can put in a thing that says, oh, when I get to this line, I don't want to proceed. I want to halt execution and let me observe and look at things. I can do that with the network which is really kind of awesome. So I will come into breakpoints here. And I'm going to enable a breakpoint. Uh, I'll remove that one. I'm going to put one back on this website. So I'm going to put the breakpoint on the response. And now when I reload this page, or not this one, this one, Charles came up to the forefront. And I am in a breakpoint. You can see here, it says breakpoint. Uh, over on the left, it's a new sub tab on the screen. I can see all the things. I can see what the request was. I can edit the response. This is kind of cool. So I could come in here and I could put in X meta something, whatever. I can come into the HTML. Uh, I could then start making modifications here. Uh, whatever I want to do, once I'm satisfied with the changes I've made, I now hit execute, and it allows the response to go back to the server. And I suspect if I look in the elements pane, there's my hi mom right there. So 
it's, it's, oh, and just to show it, uh, if I go into the network request here, here's my X meta something. It's, it's really cool to be able to put an individual breakpoint. If you know that you've got a problematic network request and you want to just say, when this one comes through, just stop. I want to see it happen. Uh, it's really nice to be able to just kind of halt, pause execution on that point. You can publish gists of anything you see. This, uh, uh, when I, again, I was talking uh, to Ben at dinner about this last night, and he didn't actually know about this feature, so that was kind of cool, uh, be able to feel like, oh, here's a new thing. So what I've done, this is my horrible website that is Comic Sans, please don't hate me. Um, I'm trying to be humorous. Uh, don't know whether or not that's effective, but I loaded this up with Charles in play, and just to be able to show you guys, I wanted to publish some gists. I actually did this one in advance because publishing the gist requires you to go in and generate a key in GitHub, and I don't want you all to have a key to my gists. Uh, also, uh, I didn't want to actually go through the upload process in the middle of the talk. So this is a gist that was generated from one load of my page. You'll notice here's the original request, here's all of the headers. Again, this includes cookies. I cannot caution you enough. If you're going to give somebody a gist of your network activity, do the network activity in a private browser, because otherwise you could theoretically be providing cookies to somebody that you don't mean to be giving them. There's a very big potential security problem here. I did this one on a completely neutral and safe user that I don't use for anything but presentations, so there's no concern about me giving away a network user or network information. You can steal this cookie all you want. And you'll notice this is actually the responses, the requests and the responses. And in this case, this is a cached hit, which you can tell because it's a bunch of 304 not modifieds. I will warn you that if you're using rewrites to modify the body of responses and you're not disabling cache, there's not a good body here to modify and you will beat your head for at least 10 minutes wondering why your modifications aren't taking place because nothing is coming back but a 304 not modified. The modifications are taking place, there's just not content there that's actually matching your modification rules. But it's really interesting to see every single one of these requests, what are all the details that are coming through on it. Uh, e tags are in place, so obviously I had some level of caching enabled. Here's one where I completely cleared my, well actually I didn't clear cache, I just turned off caching. I reset Charles, which you can do. You can always come in here and hit this little trash can and flush away all of your network stuff. Uh, I don't want to do that because I want to show you something else here in a moment, but you can completely reset all of the logging. So I reset all the logging, I disabled cache, and I reloaded the page. And now you can actually see every single response with its full content. Here's some minified JavaScript. Here's the image data that got shoved in. This is actually what got sent back, and it's preserving it as text because it's, you know, it starts as a text header, and then it's a whole bunch of noise. But it is literally every single response, all the data that you could possibly need to reconstruct it. This is admittedly maybe not as valuable as something like an HTTP archive file, a HAR. Have, how many people have heard of HARs? Very few people. So those are incredibly powerful, and I have yet to see tools that generate them consistently. This generates a very consistent level of some bit of network data. Additionally, you can actually save your sessions out of Charles. Uh, into uh, a full Charles session file if you want to be able to send that data around to other people. But if you want to just give some information to somebody who doesn't necessarily have Charles right now, uh, being able to publish a gist is pretty phenomenal. Uh, it's been very useful. Additionally, you can use Charles on other devices. So if you want to take your Android phone or you want to take your iPhone or you want to take whatever other device you have, any device you have that can be pointed at a proxy server you can actually point at the instance of Charles on your computer. So for example, when I'm doing work, I hook up this computer to our VPN, so I have access to internal resources, but it's on my same home network, you know, where I'm just sitting at home, uh, and I will then get the IP of my computer through the network, I will configure my phone to connect to that IP port 8888, which is the default Charles port. When it connects, Charles says, hey, there's a computer trying to connect to me, do you accept that? <coughs> Once I accept it, it now, all of my network connection through my phone are now routing through Charles on my desktop. I can watch all of the network details flowing through there. I can throttle my phone so that it's acting like a real device uh, or out in the wild. 
so it's, it's really powerful to be able to hook this stuff up to other devices. A whole series of other things that uh, I had not planned on demoing anyway because there's just a lot here and I'm also only at a few minutes left. Uh, you can do full on port forwarding with this stuff. You can set up reverse proxying. You can proxy SSL requests. This is kind of painful and difficult to set up the first time through, but it's worth it. Basically, you have to accept a certificate authority from Charles on your computer. That may freak you out. I can understand that. Um, but if you want to proxy an SSL request, there's not really another way to do it. It actually generates new certificates on the fly. It decrypts, does whatever it needs to, re-encrypts and sends it on. So you know, it's, it's kind of cool all the stuff it can do. Uh, you can have it mirror, uh, which you know, if I use wget, I can drop certain different commands and just mirror all the content anyway. But I can also just turn on mirroring and say I'm going to load a site and all the files are just going to dump into a directory, everything that came down. So when I'm going to help a person with debugging, I'll frequently start mirroring their site, I'll reload the page, I now have a copy of all their everything. Then I'll turn off mirroring, and then I'll start working in that copy and use map local to point to the local resources instead of the server. As a quick aside on map local, if you're trying to map to a, um, a back-end dynamic process like you've got some amazing PHP application, don't do map local because then it will just serve out your PHP source. It's not actually going to execute it. You can map remote to a local host driven server. That also works just fine. Uh, you can also have it automatically save out your sessions at certain intervals if you just kind of want to get chunked visuals on time. I've never had a need to do that. Uh, you can have it automatically validate your stuff through W3C, uh, which is really kind of cool. It, it does a lot for you. Uh, I, I would say I haven't scratched the surface, but I've actually gone kind of deep. There, there's still, though, a lot of other things that you can do with Charles, uh, and it is well worth uh, your time to investigate all the different things that Charles can do for you. Uh, thanks. So I guess I have one minute for questions, but I'm also happy to relinquish. Shoot. <laughs> uh, I was just curious, are those gist that are generated uh, secret or is there an option to make them? Uh, you choose when you make your key whether they're secret or not. If you don't set up a key, that's a really good point. You can publish a gist. If you don't go through and set up a key, it publishes an anonymous public gist that can never be cre or deleted. So, you know, don't do that. All right, thanks everyone.